What if everyone who is involved with the Church of God Evangelistic Association all over the United States of America, down in Jamaica, Hawaii, all over the world, what if we all came together in one huge convention, one huge auditorium, and we were all sitting there together and someone was going to stand up and start speaking and open services, say for an eight-day fall convention, which we'll have this year. What if Jesus Christ himself literally appeared in a vision to this whole group? Everyone at once saw this vision at the same time of Jesus Christ, just like the Apostle John when he accepted the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos. What if all of us were to see Jesus Christ in vision, not in person, because we can't look on him in his glorified state in person, face to face, and live. But what if we saw him in vision? And what if he decided that he would make an addition to the seven churches, to the letter to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3? What if he were to say to all of us, and we all as a worldwide group together, were to hear Jesus Christ in vision say this, I know your works. You produce Newswatch magazine. You produce a Bible correspondence course. You produce a radio program. You have little strength financially because you're few in number in comparison to the other churches of the world. You have intense love for each other. But I have somewhat against you in that you are yet carnal. And then suddenly the vision disappeared. And every one of us sat there, no matter what nationality you're from, no matter what language you spoke, you heard all of this in your own language. And what if we sat there dumbfounded and we looked at each other and said, Me? Carnal? How could this be? I am filled with God's Holy Spirit. I have a love for God. I'm on my way into the kingdom of God. How could I possibly be carnal? Well, let's turn to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Because here is a book to a church that was probably the most messed up church that you could ever want to encounter or not want to encounter. Starting in verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. So this is Paul establishing that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. This particular group didn't necessarily accept Paul. And he had to fight to retain his identity as a true apostle of Jesus. Verse 2, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Here, these people in Corinth, and when you read this whole book, you see that they had very little truth, very little. They abused everything there was to the New Testament church. And yet Paul said, unto the church of God, he admitted they were a church, they had God's Holy Spirit, and he even said they were sanctified, which means they were set apart for holy use. That's what sanctification means. They were set apart in ho for holy use in Christ Jesus. So these people, no matter how many false teachings they had, they were in Christ Jesus. Now that's dumbfounding. Because so many times we think we have to have all truth to be a Christian. Well now let's drop down into verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. So it was then and it is today, Jesus Christ and he alone that gives grace. No human being, no minister, no lay member, I don't care what the person's title, what his rank in society, whether he's a rich man or a poor man or in between, it doesn't matter because only Jesus Christ can give grace. No one else. Jesus Christ. Verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. So you see, it's Jesus Christ is the one who enriches in everything. All knowledge. No man other than the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then it's up to each one of us to look into the pages of the Bible 
to prove all things and to make sure that what the minister says is indeed correct because we're all human. Verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Now, this church, as we're going to see, he says you are yet carnal, and yet he says Jesus Christ is confirmed in them. Christ in you or you're not a New Testament Christian. It's that simple. Either Jesus Christ resides inside of you by the power of his Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. There's no in between. Either you have the Spirit or you don't. Now, Romans chapter 8. Hold your finger there in 1 Corinthians. Let's read verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, and he's talking to Christians, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That makes it very clear that no matter who you are, no matter how sincere you are, if the Holy Spirit of God has not come into your mind, if there has not been true repentance of your sins and baptism for the remission of those sins, then you do not have God's Holy Spirit no matter how sincere you are. But Christ's Holy Spirit must be in you. And these people did not have all truth. And yet they were in Christ Jesus. Let's not, let's not stop there. Let's go to verse 9. God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice we're called unto the fellowship with Jesus. And he's the very Son of God. Now if Christ is living his life over inside of us as a New Testament Christian... By the power of his Holy Spirit, listen to this now, can we reject other Christians without rejecting Jesus Christ? Think about that. If God's Holy Spirit is in someone else, and we're not to be that judge, he is, then can we reject someone else that says, I'm a Christian, without rejecting Jesus Christ? Christ? That's a deep question to ponder. Because let's face it, many are going to come in Christ's name saying and admitting Jesus is the Christ and are going to deceive many. And yet, what is the relationship we have? Can we only see by their fruits over a period of time whether they're true Christians or not? That's the only way. We cannot reject, I don't believe, someone who says they're a Christian no matter how much error they have until they have proven themselves by the fruit of their life that they are not Christians. Now, verse 10. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Now, this doesn't mean that we're all a, a few robots walking around repeating the same thing. We have to have every sing, single concept the same. But what he means is that we overall have a unity of mind in Jesus Christ. We all have the same foundation even with different backgrounds, different personalities, different understandings on certain points that don't matter for salvation, we shouldn't cause divisions among ourselves. Let's, let's finish the sentence. That you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So what Paul is seeking is unity in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior not the unity in a man, but in Christ. Because there's no other foundation except Jesus Christ upon which the New Testament was laid. So we can't build a church organization built upon a man. It must be Jesus Christ. Now drop down to verse 11. For it has been declared unto me, or unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you contentions among the brethren who all have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But why is there contentions? Verse 12, now this I say that every one of you say, I am of Paul. Another will say, I'm of Apollos. He's an eloquent speaker. Another says, well, I'm of Cephas. I'm of Peter because he speaks prophecy. And look at this, even some of them even dared to admit and said, I'm of Christ. Wow. <laughs> They're dividing up 
the church and polarizing around men instead of whoever is giving the message, checking the scriptures to see if whatever they say is accurate and true, and then gleaning something from that message. I think this verse very clearly is giving us the reason why there ends up being divisions, contentions within the church. Because we, as physical human beings, look at the physical rather than Jesus Christ who is now spiritual. As a direct result, we end up following men instead of Jesus Christ as he leads the men. You see, there is a difference in following men and following Jesus. There is a difference. Dividing up and taking sides rather than searching, sifting out spiritual food, and then digesting it no matter which minister gives the message. I think this is very important because I think that our failure to realize that God is the one who does the calling. God is the one who sets people within his body. This has caused untold damage to the church. And therefore we polarize around men and personalities rather than the message and Jesus Christ. So rather than cooperate with no matter who is doing the speaking, whatever congregation, wherever it might be, we draw boundary lines. We draw it around the personality. Here's my minister over here because he preaches this, another over here because he preaches that. When we need to have a balanced diet. Now, let's turn to Proverbs 6, verse 16 to 19. But we'll go back to where we are in 1 Corinthians. But Proverbs 6, verse 16. This is what Jesus, the Christ of Almighty God, says. These six things does the Lord hate. Yes, seven are an abomination unto him. I only want to read the last five or six words of verse 19. He that sows discord among brethren. God hates sowing discord among brethren. And what is one of the greatest and easiest ways of sowing discord? Polarizing around men and their personalities instead of accepting a message of what anybody says, proving it in scripture, if that person is wrong on a point, reject the point. But then glean out all the other spiritual information that you can get from that. I think we need to watch out in the future as we grow as an organization that we not polarize and therefore we stop our ears to someone who can have some wonderful truth. But since our, we had earplugs in, we didn't get to receive that part of the spiritual diet, diet that God is wanting to give us. We need to learn to judge sinful acts against godly acts. And therefore, we will eliminate polarization and putting a man on a pedestal. See? You learn from the spiritual and reject the physical. And I won't turn to it, but you can read Galatians 5, 19 to 23. It compares the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. And it shows what we should develop, the spiritual aspect, and put off the fleshly aspect. Verse 13, and this is where I get the title for the sermon today. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul wants to know, and he wants the Corinthian church to give him an answer. He wants to bring it to their mind so vividly that he even used some of the greatest workers and evangelists of that time. Apollos was a very polished speaker. He was probably the best speaker of all those in the early New Testament times. He was an eloquent man. He had a vocabulary that was out of sight according to the scriptures. And Peter was a very powerful man. When he walked in, everybody took notice. These are the people Paul is comparing himself to. Then he was more of a weak, smaller type man. And so he had trouble having identity with people. They wanted to reject him as, oh, you're not an apostle. And yet he was. And yet he compares all these people and says, did any one of these people baptize you into their name? Then if they did, you're not a Christian. Only into Jesus Christ, then you're a Christian. So what's happening is, Paul is bringing to their attention here in Corinth the very fact that they as a church group 
are dividing Jesus Christ up into little bitty pieces. Instead of him remaining the head of the overall body of Christ, he's dividing it up into a little bit, little bit over here for Paul, a little bit over here for Peter, a little bit over here for Apollos. And if you've got six more ministers, each one has their favorite minister, which I guess all human beings are that way. I'm the same way. <laughs> I have to admit it, but I'll work on it. We all have to be able to glean spiritual information from whoever is doing the speaking or else we are going to become imbalanced and we're going to start dying spiritually. Now let's drop down to verse 18. You can read the rest of this if you want at your own time. For the preaching of the cross, this is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, is to them that perish, now the word should be our perishing, is foolishness. It doesn't mean anything to them. But unto us which are saved, or in the process of being saved, it is the power of God. So unto us that are being saved, preaching Christ is the power of God. But we had better be careful so that we'll not divide God up into little bitty pieces over little tiny picky things that has nothing to do with salvation. Because when we do that, we divide up the body of Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe it, just find you a religious encyclopedia and look at the number of Christian churches in the world. Over 800, all claiming to be the one true church of Jesus Christ with the perfect doctrines of Jesus Christ. All of them can't be right. And yet they all, instead of saying, well, I don't understand that, but I accept your word that you're a Christian until you show me by the fruit of your life you're not, then I will accept you as a brother. Drop down to verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that many, not many, see I left out the word not to make sure you were paying attention, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised, God has chosen. That's fantastic. And things which are not to bring to nothing things that are. So God is calling out at this present time a group of people from all over the world. The weak people of the world. He's not calling the princes, the presidents, the presidents, those in mighty dictatorial governments all over the world. He's not calling them. It's a rarity when one of them will submit and humble to Jesus Christ. But he's calling us. And I think if each one of us that is listening to this or ever will hear this on tape, think of ourselves. Are we mighty? Who are we? in comparison to the other people of the world. And then let's ask ourselves, do we fit into this category? I know I do, and if it weren't for the grace of God, I would still be out there working after the flesh. Verse 29, the reason God has chosen the weak at this present time, that no flesh should glory in God's presence. Nobody can glory in God's presence. He is the one who's called, not many mighty, not many of the intelligentsia of the world, not many of the elite, the world leaders, the rich. But he's called the weak of the world to accept Jesus Christ at this time. And then when you read in Revelation chapter 20, you see that we at this time are going to become kings and priests when Christ returns and we are going to be the teachers and the priests of the world. And we are going to have the opportunity to teach the rest of the world this Bible. That is fantastic how he could take people so weak, so poor in this world's goods and yet rich in faith and then exalt them to such a high position. Whoever God has set in the church, no matter who they are, whether they be a minister, a lay member, it doesn't matter because no one on the face of the earth is a threat to another Christian. Nobody is. No one is a threat. Now, I want to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul is going to get to the very, I guess you took an old phrase you could say, the nitty gritty of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is what the whole book is talking about. Start in verse 1 through 11. 
And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. This was the problem of the Corinthian church. They had accepted Jesus Christ. They were in Christ, but they hadn't begun to develop the spiritual. They were still walking after the flesh. Notice, he had to speak unto them as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not the meat. And that's what we're trying to do here is to grow up from the milk and go on to meat. For here too you were not able to bear it, neither yet were you able to bear it. These people have been converted for years and yet they still couldn't accept meat of the Bible. They were still all the way back at the very basic first principles of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, for you are yet carnal. And why could he say that about them? For whereas there is among you envying, they were jealous of each other, they were comparing each other with, each, with the other person. One person had more physical goods than another, so they compared themselves, and they would say, well, I have more, I'm prospering more, therefore I must be more spiritual than you. They were comparing each other, and that's wrong. To be exact, it's sin. When you compare one another with each other, it is sin. They also had strife among them. Divisions. And what were the divisions? Because they were polarizing around men instead of Jesus Christ. And he asked the question, are you yet, are you not yet carnal? And walk as men and not as Jesus Christ in you? Spiritual? Verse 4. For while one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who is then Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I've planted. That's what Paul did. He went out, he dug up the dirt, he planted the seed. The seed is in each of our mind when we hear the word. Apollos came along and he watered it. He preached to them and helped them to grow a little bit. But God gave the increase. And that's all any minister does is to help you to grow, and God will produce the fruit in your life if you allow him to. Verse 7. So then neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. So you see, everything that happens in the Christian community has got to be polarized around Jesus Christ and God the Father who is going to produce the fruit, not the men whom God sets within the church. They're only there to learn from. Verse 8. Now he that plants and he that waters are one. Both human beings that God is using for a purpose. And every man shall receive his own reward. Now this is talking about those that are ministering to the congregation in this case. Not the reward of all saints but just the individual ministry. Each man will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. You're not any man's building. You're God's. You're Jesus Christ. He's in you. No man can be in you. Verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, this is Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. He came and preached to them. Another builds their own. And what foundation was that he laid? We're going to see it in just a second. But let every man take heed how he builds upon it. Now, here's the foundation. And if anybody comes to you and you listen to any other minister and he doesn't give this foundation, find out what foundation he's laying. Verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Everything must revolve around Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 4 proves absolutely that Jesus Christ was, before his human birth, the God of the Old Testament that dealt with Israel. John 1, 1, verse 1 to 3 and verse 14 shows clearly that Jesus Christ was the Word in the beginning with God. And he was God and he is the one that has dealt nearly exclusively, not altogether, but nearly exclusively with the human race. It's Jesus Christ. That's why all judgment is going to be given into his hand. Now... We've got to remember that dividing up Christ and polarizing around separate men is a sign of carnality, not spirituality. 
We've got to remember that. Now, there's nothing wrong with liking certain type of messages. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying when we reject someone that speaks in the pulpit because he's not my favorite minister, then we're showing signs of carnality. And that's what we have to repent of. This is very specific because he lists the powerful ministers of his day. Peter, Paul, Apollos. You can't find more powerful ministers. And yet they were dividing up the church into little pieces in Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says that he does not want the church to remain in ignorance. He says, now concerning spiritual, the word spiritual means supernatural. The word gifts doesn't appear in the original. It's just added. If you've got a King James Version and if it's in italics, you'll see there's no such word in the original language. It was added by the translators. Now concerning spiritual or the supernatural, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. So he wants them to have an understanding so they can get off the carnal physical plane into the spiritual plane and live where Jesus Christ and God the Father are living. In other words, it takes the power of God to throw off the flesh. Amen. And therefore, once we throw off the flesh, the envying strife, polarizing around men, then we won't be dividing up the church anymore. But that takes the power of God in us to do it. And that is no human feat. We can't do it ourselves. Either God's Spirit accomplishes it through us, or we'll never do it. Verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. So it shows that God's Holy Spirit can give different gifts within the church so that the church can grow spiritually. Verse 5, there are differences of administration. Now the word administration is a mistranslation. If you have a more expensive Bible, you can see it's got a little number by it. It means ministries. God raises up different ministries. The Greek word is diakona. D-I-A-K-O-N-I-A, -I -I and it means ministries. So we are not the only ministry of Jesus Christ on the face of the earth. We're not. We have a certain amount of truth, and we're growing, and we have an open mind to where we want to grow into new truth and not reject any. But we're not the only one, but we're trying to grow. Verse 6, and there are diversities or differences of operations, but it's the same spirit or the same God that works all in all. In other words, the word operation means different workings. There are some ministries that use TV, some radio, some magazines. Some are called even street ministries where they work with the skid row, the poverty stricken out on the streets. There are different ministries. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit all. And when we close our ears to a possible minister of Jesus Christ, we might just possibly be committing spiritual malnutrition. You know, we have to have a daily diet, balanced food. We have to have amino acids in the body. We have to have vitamin C, the B complex. We have to have vitamin K, all the vitamins, all the minerals to keep this body in perfect condition. God has built the physical, and he said the spiritual operates the same way. When we reject a part of the ministry of Christ that could give us the amino acids, when maybe this minister over here is giving vitamin A, another one over here vitamin C, another one over here vitamin B, but what if you're missing the amino acids? Cancer sets in. It's going to bring spiritual death. That's a major concept that we have to understand. The Corinthians didn't understand it. God is the one that places in the church different ministries. It says so. I'm not going to die scripture. He said it. I'm going to believe it. This is not the only ministry on the face of the earth. We're one of them and I believe God is using us powerfully and he's raising us, us up and all of us that have been here from the beginning realize it. That we have gradually grown and grown and grown. But there are other people that you can learn from. Now, you have to know your Bible to make sure they don't mislead you. You better know that first. And then if you can glean out a gem of truth, good. But don't let them pull you into error. That's why you have to study daily to show yourself approved. Well, let's go on down to verse 7 now. I've already read that. Verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. 
to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit. So you see it's the same spirit that puts in the various gifts in the church so that we can all grow. To another faith by the same spirit. So there is a gift of faith that's over and beyond which each of us has. Every one of us have faith in Jesus Christ. But God can supernaturally give someone, if he selects to, the gift of faith that's over and beyond what he would normally have. And it would be a supernatural gift. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. And that has two meanings. It means speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, or it means to foretell the future. Both meanings. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of languages or tongues. To another, the interpretation of those tongues. But all these work that one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man as he will. And we cannot look at someone else that's a little different from us, and they have a basic amount of truth, and they're in Christ Jesus, and they show it with the fruit of their life, we can't look at them and say, you're not a Christian. We're going to let Jesus do the judging. Jesus, if he decides they're not the Christian, let's let that happen. But let's not let us set ourselves up as a judge over God's people. And we're going to see it a verse in a minute. If you judge someone else, then you have usurp the authority and power of God and Jesus Christ. We'll see that verse in just a minute. Verse 12, same chapter, 1 Corinthians 12. For as the body is one and as many members, and all the members that are of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. He's showing us what the church is. There's only one church, but there's many members. There's one body of Jesus Christ, but... There are many members that make up the body. And he goes on in the next verses, which I'll not read, and it gives an example of it. It shows how one person or one church group may be the kidney. Another one may be the spleen. Another one may be the left big toe. Another one the brain or something. Various parts of the body, but it's one body. They all work together to keep it a well-organized, functioning body. Now, let's drop down to verse 18. But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. I do know all of the scriptures that says that there are going to be many coming in Jesus' name and deceiving many. That's true. That's why if you're not studying your Bible every day, all the time, so that you can detect when you hear someone, whether he is a false minister or true, then you'll get yourself in trouble. But if you're in Christ Jesus and God's Holy Spirit is living in you, He will lead you. And you will eventually be able to determine whether that person is false or not. Um, but God has set members, every one as it's pleased Him. Notice, God is the one that's setting in the body. But we, as people, are the ones who want to chop up the body. We're the ones that let our own human mind and our own human reasoning, our own little pet theories of the Bible come in and divide up the body. I'm of this minister. I'm of this one. Oh, I'm of this one. I'm of this one. So as a result, you get a one-sided view of the Bible instead of an overall approach to the Bible. Okay? Verse, eight, uh, verse 25. That there be no schism or divisions in the body but that the members should have the same care for one another. So every one of us should care, and we should care about other people. I don't care if they have a difference with us. We should love them anyway, because God sent his only son into the world. He wanted none to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. He doesn't want any to perish, so why should we? We shouldn't. We should love them in spite of a difference we have, no matter what it is. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And when there's division among a local congregation or even a national organization, it does cause that body to suffer. And do you realize who is suffering? It's not just us. Because Jesus Christ is the head of that body. Amen. Think about it. Your nerve endings from your finger goes all the way up your arm and it connects to your spinal column and into the base of your brain. Where is Jesus Christ? He's the head. 
All the pain and the division that goes on in the church goes straight to the head, Jesus Christ. We're the ones that are dividing up the body of Christ, and it's hurting Jesus to see us suffer. And when we suffer, we're causing Him to suffer. Verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. He specifically chose every one that has come to Him. Everyone. He did it, not us. We didn't choose anybody. You go out and you try to tell somebody about the Sabbath, the seventh day. Oh, they're all against that. And yet it's in the Bible and nobody can find anything different. And yet... God chose you, and if He didn't choose you, you wouldn't be here. Amen. It says so. John 15, 16. Christ said, You have not chosen me. I, Jesus Christ, have chosen you and ordained you. And if He didn't choose you, you wouldn't be here. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Verse 28. And God has set some in the church. Notice, it's God that sets in the church. First, apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers. This is for the perfecting of the saints, as we'll see. After that, miracles, then he, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of languages or tongues. And then he asked the question, and I think it's a logical question that all of us need to know an answer to. Are all apostles? Well, of course not. God is the one that sets in the church. If he had all apostles, he would have no other parts of the body. Are all prophets? Of course not. Are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. So what if a group is being raised up of God, a different ministry from ours, and they have all kind of miracles being worked in their midst? It's a gift from God. And it says very clearly here that God's the one that gives that gift, and He doesn't give it to everybody. He gives it to them. He didn't give it to us. See? Should we be jealous of them? No, we should praise God because of what He's doing through them. You see? It makes all the difference in the world as to how you look at other people. Then you can release your mind of condemnation and let Jesus be the judge and not you. Wow. Well, verse 30. Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Now, notice what Jesus said. He inspired Paul. Paul wrote it down. But covet or desire, earnestly desire the best gifts. Now, let's go from there. I believe we can literally stifle spiritual maturity. We can stifle spiritual maturity if we're going to divide up the body. Now, God has called us to this work. Okay, that's fine. But that doesn't mean that we can't learn from someone else a point here and a point there to put together with something that we haven't learned yet. And yet, we don't want to follow somebody down the street that's in error on other points. If he's got one point and he's missing nine, let's don't follow those nine, see? Let's make sure we don't do that. But I personally am not in competition with anybody on earth. I'm not, and I hope you won't be. Because if God gives you the gift of healing, that's wonderful. If God doesn't give you the gift of healing, that's all right. He's given you His Holy Spirit. You're in the body. That's all that counts. That's all that counts is you're in the body. Now, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 11 through 16. And He, this is Jesus Christ once again, and God the Father, gave some apostles and some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why did he do this? The Bible tells us, he says in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints and human beings have put a comma there. Comma there. there was no comma in the original language. He's put various teachers within the body for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Jesus Christ expects me to stand before you teach you everything I understand about this Bible so that you can become mature spiritually in Christ to qualify to be a minister to everybody in your neighborhood. Everybody you know. Jesus has called you and ordained you. Not just me. He set me in a specific category to help you to do what He's called us all for. That's what it says. I can't deny it. And if I fail in my training you to be a minister to bring other people to Christ... I'm a failure. 
Also, prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers were put in the church for the edifying of the body, lifting up, building up the body so that when you walk out here, you're going to face the world in a positive attitude, knowing that you have overcome the world in Jesus Christ. Verse 13, till we all come into the unity of the faith, and what was it Paul said? They were causing divisions because they were polarizing around men. And then he goes on and clarifies in 1 Corinthians 12 and here in Ephesians 4 that we all in the ministry were put there to try to unify in the faith and also until we all come to a knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. I believe that God has set various ones within the church so that you can be spiritually perfected, so that you won't remain milk Christians, but so that you can grow up and eat filet, so that you can go out and eat out of this Bible steaks. You can go on strong meat. Now, I want to pause right there because this is strong. And I want to go to another scripture and come back to Ephesians. But in 1 Timothy, <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 3, here is a qualification for something. Here is a qualification for two different categories here. In verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 1, it says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop. Now, what is a bishop? All right, I want to read it to you. The, the actual definition of this word bishop. From the Strong's Concordance, it comes from number, the word number 1983 and 84. It means superintendent, overseer, someone to take the oversight over the flock. I believe at this time, this is what God has called me for in this particular ministry. To be a bishop or overseer overseeing this particular work that he's doing. Now, it gives the qualifications. I won't go through these qualifications. But look down in verse 8. It gives another classification. Likewise, must the deacons... This is someone else. Now, I want to give the concept that most churches in the past has held. They've had this in their mind as what a deacon is. I grew up believing this. I don't believe there's over three or four churches that I know of that has a true understanding of this word. Here's the understanding I grew up with, then I'll give you what the Bible says. And then you be the judge as which is correct. The Bible or what I've believed before and what many of you probably have believed or most of you probably presently believe. The word deacon, most churches say, it means you are a, a person who takes care of the physical surroundings. You may straighten up the chairs, set up the microphones, do everything physically and that's all. Now I want to read to you what the real definition of this word means. Now this is from the Bible, and I'm going to stand on the word of God, I hope you will, once it's proven to you. It comes from the Greek word number 1247 and 1249. It means to be an attendant, there's the physical part, to wait upon, to be a host, to host the congregation, the assembly of saints, teacher, minister, servant, pastor. Those are all the definition of the word deacon. Now, look up the, the Greek word for minister found in Matthew 20, verse 26 and 27, and every other word where it's talking about a minister of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. It'll always come from the Greek word number 1249, the same as deacon, and yet it's translated ministers elsewhere. So a deacon, when a person is ordained as a deacon, he is ordained as a minister of Jesus Christ with full authority to stand in the pulpit and speak to you spiritual things. Not just to host the group, but it's, he has an awesome responsibility of seeing to it all the physical surroundings are ready and prepared for you to come to learn. And then he also carries the responsibility of speaking to you spiritual things. That's why qualifications are laid down in Scripture to show what he must do and the lifestyle that he must portray before you. Now, 
Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4. But I think that's very important that we understand that because this concept of the word deacon in the past has only been carried to a physical level. And yet, when I read the definition right out of the Strong's Concordance, it absolutely proves that a deacon, when someone is ordained as a deacon, that person is to be an attendant to the congregation. He's to host it. He's to be a minister. He's to be a teacher and a pastor. That's what it says. And every place where minister is translated in the New Testament as minister, meaning someone who is serving the people, it's always number 1249, the same as deacon, every single time. So anytime if you see me ordain someone into the office of deacon, you know it's a full-fledged minister who is to give you spiritual food. Okay, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll finish the, uh, the section here about perfecting the saints. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, this is what we're supposed to be. And in the previous verse, we are to build you up as the congregation so you'll not be tossed back and forth. So Ephesians 4 verse 15, so that we may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. So you see, Christ is the one that's going to put us all in the positions that he wants us in the body. And so he's the one working in us, not just men, not just men. Now, I want you to see something that staggers my mind. I hope it will yours. Verse 17 and 18. Remember the setting of this book. Paul has converted people of other nations instead of Israelites. They're called Gentiles to the truth. Look what he says. This I say and testify in the Lord that you walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. After the flesh, carnality. Look what he says, though. Having the understanding darkened, if we retreat backwards and we go back living after the flesh and after the mind, we're going to have our mind darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now, you look up the word blindness, you'll see that the actual Greek translation is hardness. Because people are walking after their own desires and their own ways and not willing to submit to this book and be corrected by it. If we do that, we're going to become darkened and we're going to end up going right back out into the world. Just like those who have never been called and illuminated through the Jesus Christ. To me, this is dramatic. This means not one of us is safe if we set our own little pet doctrine and we begin judging every other person, comparing them with ourself and saying, you're not a Christian because you don't fit my specifications. Therefore, we're literally alienating ourselves from the rest of the body and Jesus is going to cut out the cancer cells, cells from his body. He's not going to have a degenerate body. And therefore, our minds will become darkened and we'll end up going back out into the world. Well, there is a second part to dividing up Christ. The first part is just polarizing around men, which I've tried to show. But a second part is in judging and despising other members within the body. In Romans chapter 14, Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 4, Him that is weak in the faith, now this gives a large category. You might be strong in one place, but you may be weak in another point that you've never even heard from Scripture. So how could you be strong in it? But it says, Him that is weak in the faith receive, but not to doubtful dispensations. <clears throat> now the word not to doubtful dispensation, that phrase should read, not to judge his doubtful thoughts. Let's face it. We're going to have people coming in the door who have just, they've never had anything to do with the Bible before. Or they may have been in a church that teaches the exact opposite of what this book says. When they walk through the door, we're not to judge their doubts of what we believe. We're not to do it. Because they are coming to learn to prove whether we have what the scriptures say. Give them time. And then if they look into the scripture and have an open mind with God's spirit working in it, 
They're going to prove what's the truth. Okay. Verse, verse 2. For one believes that he may eat all things. This means meat that God has given for us to eat. And of course that's clean meats. We don't want to eat those things that the Bible says not to. Another who is weak eats herbs. So he's a vegetarian. Let not him that eats despise him that doesn't eat. So if a person comes in and he's a vegetarian, he had never heard of the Bible before, the laws of clean and unclean meats, he thinks that if you eat meat, it's unhealthy for him because of all the pesticides that goes in them and he grows his food organically. All of a sudden we begin to judge him and say, hey, you can eat meats. And because he won't, then we begin to look down on that person. Oh no, don't you judge that person because they have a doubtful disputation or a thought in their mind. Verse 4 or verse 3. Let not him that eats despise him that eats not. And let not him that eats judge him that eats not. For God has received him. And who is a man to reject someone that God has received? Wow. That means we would be setting ourselves up as judge over God's heritage. Verse 4. Who are you that judges another man's servant? Jesus Christ is the one that bought you and is reconciling you back to God the Father. You're not my servant. You're not John Trescott's servant. You're not Ross May's. You're not Stan Taylor's. You're Jesus Christ's servant. You see, I'm placed here for one thing, to edify you to go out and live a righteous life and to teach you all I know so that you can be a minister of Jesus Christ to everybody you come in contact with. That's my job to you. So who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master, so to Jesus Christ, he stands or falls. You're responsible to Jesus Christ. You'll fall before him, not before me. Yes, he shall be held up. So God is going to hold you up, for God is able to make him stand. That's dynamite. God can make every one of us stand. And no man, not one of us, should ever judge another person. Let's drop down to verse 11. I want to skip a little here. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Every person on earth is either going to bow to Jesus Christ, confess Him as their Savior, or they're going to go into the lake of fire. It's that simple. So who are you and me to try to have men to confess to us? Who are we to be so self-righteous and so self-centered and think we have all truth that we're going to reject someone because they don't have the same understanding we do? They're going to live or fall to Jesus Christ, not to us. We can't require people to confess to us. We can't do that. Only God will receive the confession of these people and Jesus Christ. Verse 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I'm not going to give an account for you. You're not going to give one for me. You're on your own. My job is to teach you everything I know. You prove to see whether it's true or not. Then you become mature in Christ so that we can eat the strong meat and not the milk. The first principles. Verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another any more. That is a direct commandment of Jesus Christ through the Apostle Paul. Let us not therefore judge one another any more. How much clearer can it be? And yet we're human and we have these tendencies. Well, we're going to work on it. That's why we're having a sermon on it, so that we can work on it and not judge one another. But he says, judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So don't go out of your way to try to force somebody to believe every little thing just like you do when it doesn't depend on salvation. Now, we can't condone breaking of the law, the Ten Commandments. That's, God, that's how God determines sin. You never compromise with that. But if somebody wants to know how many angels can sit on the head of a pen, oh, who cares, you know? But you don't have to say it to them if it seems important. I mean, I'm just using a little uh, ridiculous statement to give you an, uh, an analogy. Verse 13, I'm only going to read the last part uh, at this particular time. Oh, I've already done that. So what we want to do now is make sure that we don't judge each other. Because every one of us are going to have different thoughts on different things occasionally. Until we grow up into a more unified mind among us all. Now drop back to verse 8 and 9. I skipped this deliberately. 
For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Not another man's. We're not the ministers. The ministers to serve. That's all. Verse 9. For to this end, or this purpose, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So we're God's. We should not be dividing up the body, and therefore or we should be learning from the whole body, all that we can. But then it's your responsibility to make sure you know what this Bible says, so much so that nobody's going to deceive you. Because you see... The minister is not going to be there to hold your hand every day. You're going to be confronted with questions, thoughts of other people that's going to throw you. And then you're going to have warfare with Satan and his demons who are invisible. They're going to try to put thoughts into your mind to try to twist scripture to throw you and take you away from Jesus Christ. So you see, you're going to have to grow up and learn there is a spiritual battle. Physical human beings aren't your enemy, not one. Even though they can curse you to your face, they can withdraw fellowship from you, they're not your enemy. Satan and his demons, the invisible world, they're your enemy. So you don't have to, you can love human beings no matter what they do to you. Because eventually God is going to offer everyone salvation. Well, judging is what we're talking about now. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. Verse 1 to 5. Now, this, some of this is going to be very dramatic when we understand that God, Christ, is not divided, and it's us by polarizing around men, number one, and number two, by judging each other by our own standard is what divides the body of Christ. Chapter 7, verse 1 to 5. Judge not that you be not judged. Now, the word here is condemn not. Verse 2. For with what judgment you judge or you condemn someone else, you shall be judged or condemned. And with what measure you meet or you give out your judgment of condemnation, it shall be measured to you again. It's the law. God has made it. He set it in motion. Whatever you do to somebody else, it's going to return to you. Verse 3. Why do you behold this little tiny moat, this little tiny speck, in your brother's eye, but you consider not the huge giant beam, a big log that's sticking out of your eye. Here you got all kind of problems in your own life, but you're over here trying to correct somebody else. God is saying, get your life straight first, then help your brother. <laughs> that's what all of us need to do. And brother, it's a problem. <laughs> We're all human. Okay, verse 4. Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out the moat out of your eye, and behold, a beam is still in your eye. Look what God calls this, you hypocrite. Now, we're not calling each other hypocrites because we're all on the road to salvation. We're wanting that. But I'm just saying this so we won't revert backwards. You hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, get your life straight, then you can see clearly. You'll be spiritually mature to help the babes in Christ is what he's saying. And I think if we can learn this one lesson, we can stop dividing the body of Jesus Christ into little bitty picky points. So I guess if I want to summarize this scripture right here, it's with what quantity and quality of your judgment toward others, that's what will determine the same quantity and quality of judgment that you'll receive from Jesus Christ. So be careful when you ever point a finger at somebody else. You never want to look on the outward appearance. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 14. And Jesus said unto him, See, some of the brethren came to him, and they wanted to know, uh, they wanted to know how to divide up their inheritance. They wanted Jesus to be the judge for them. And Jesus said unto the man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Now, they wanted him to split up the inheritance. So he was not going to judge their physical matters. So making judgments is what ends up causing divisions. Judgments that should not be based upon appearance and physical carnal minds. 
So Christ, and he shows this in Matthew 25, 31 to 34, Christ, is going, when he returns, he's going to separate. He is going to be a judge then. He is going to be a divider. But now he's not going to divide physical things, but then he's going to divide the sheep from the goat. He's going to set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. He's going to make a separation. He will then be a judge. He'll make the division, but not now. He's not going to make it now. He's going to force you and me to grow among other people and grow up to be spiritually mature among false teaching. He's just going to do it. And you're going to be bombarded with it. I know you already have been. I've been all my life. And that's why the only authority is Jesus Christ. Now, a couple of more scriptures. Luke 19, verse 22. Luke 19, verse 22. And he said unto him, Out of your own mouth will I judge you. Any word that you and I say, I believe, this is my personal opinion, there is no scripture to say it, but I believe since God says the things you see on the physical earth, you can tell the Godhead and how he operates by the things that are made. We have movie cameras, we take snapshots of our children, uh, we have motion picture, uh, we can take live Move, uh, you know, go out water ski, and here you see it live. And then you get to fall over in the water, you see it live and in color. I believe God has angels, and he's taken every single one of our lives from birth all the way through, recording every one of our lives, and he knows our every thought and intent, so that when he wants to, he can say, you judge somebody over here, you judge somebody over there. What have you got to say? You never repented of that. How am I going to judge you? Because here's the proof, here's the evidence. How is he going to know unless he has some way of recording everything that we've done our entire lives? He says, out of your own mouth will I judge you, you wicked servant. So out of our mouths, we're going to be judged. Verse 27, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. This is the result of not believing Jesus Christ and changing before his words, the Bible. We're going to be judged by every word we say out of our mouth. If those words aren't what comes from this Bible, the end result will be being slain before Jesus. Now, a couple of dynamite scriptures. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. This is a scripture I told you before I wanted to get to. Starting in verse 7 through verse 12. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. If we're polarizing around men and dividing the church, then we could be a sinner. Because God hates division. If we are judging other brethren and causing division, we're a sinner. It says so. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted, mourn, if necessary, fast if you have a problem. And weep. Let your laughter be tur turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. So if you are caught in sin, in some particular sin, if necessary, fast before God. Be very humble yourself before him. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. Speak not evil one of another. He that speaks evil of his brother, and look what he says, and judges his brother, speaks evil of the law. Do we comprehend what that's saying? If anyone that is, has God's Holy Spirit speaks evil of his brother. Now, I don't mean just standing in conversation talking about events that did happen. I'm talking about judging the intents and thoughts of that person's mind, whether he is a Christian, isn't a Christian, whether he knows better or not to do something, then we're judging the law, and we're speaking evil of it. He says, and you judge the law. If you judge the law... You are not a doer of it, but a judge. And only God the Father and Jesus Christ are the judges right now. They're the lawgiver, not one of us. We have been lawbreakers, so we cannot judge our brethren. We can't do it. For there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. 
And that lawbreaker or that lawgiver is not a human being. It's not you. It's not me. It's not anyone else. It's God. And the God family is the lawgiver. James 5, verse 24 to 30. Or John, I'm sorry, John 5, verse 24 to 30. We're getting down to the end now. But I want to end with a statement right out of Scripture. And it's powerful. But John 5, verse 24 to 30. Verily I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me, so that's God the Father, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation or judgment, but is passed from death unto life. Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has given life in himself, or he has life in himself, inherent within him, so has he given the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment. Jesus is the only one that has the authority to execute judgment, because he Jesus is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear His voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, those that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation, that is, condemnation. Verse 30, I, this is Jesus Christ, can do of mine own self nothing. Christ experienced all the fleshly pulls just like you and me. He qualified to be the judge, not us. We're not judges. He is the judge, only Him. Men nearly always seek their own desire in judging someone else. They're never impartial. Men always judge somebody else from their own eyes, their own background. But look what Jesus said. Because I, He says, verse 30, I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear I judge from the Father. And my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus is going to judge us because God the Father and Jesus are going to be in perfect union. They've not sinned. They're not judging from a physical, carnal aspect, point of view. We do, therefore we cannot judge because every time it ends, ends up making us sin. John 7, 24. John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And this is what always happens. We only have a limited amount of knowledge. We look at someone else and judge them from that limited amount of knowledge and we've never walked in that person's shoes. We've never traveled his road. We don't know his background or her background. Therefore, why are we judging them? Why aren't we accepting them as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ? John 12. John 12, verse 46 to 50. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. This is the ultimate purpose of Jesus, to save everybody. He that rejects me and receives not my words, and we've read Jesus' words today where we're carnal if we polarize around men and cause division. We're carnal if we judge others. If we reject Jesus' words, we have one that's going to judge us. The word that I've spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I've not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And Jesus follows it out to the letter. I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. How do we come into unity? We come into unity of mind because the Father told Jesus what to speak. He wrote it on paper. He's the word to the human race. If we get in harmony with what this book says and not our own preconceived concept of what the book says, we can come and have a unified mind. Now, only one other statement and then, believe me, I will conclude. In Leviticus chapter 5, Verse 14 to 19. 
we don't have a complete understanding sometime of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And yet in Leviticus chapter 5, <clears throat> we're going to see something that's very amazing. Jesus had, was a perfect sacrifice. Every sin that could ever be committed, no matter what it is, his sacrifice represented it. Jesus didn't come to condemn, he came to save. Leviticus 5, verse, four, or, yeah, verse 14, And the Lord spake unto Moses. So this is Jesus Christ speaking, not Moses, this isn't a man speaking. Now I just want to mention verse 19. It is a trespass offering. He has certainly trespassed against the Lord. Now how did he trespass? Here he's bringing this offering to the Lord. But what did he do? Okay, verse 15. If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance. You see, God has even in his all-wise judgment and his plan of salvation has even offered a sacrifice. His sacrifice, if a person is ignorant of sin and he's committing that sin, Jesus can forgive him. But, here's the big catch. When you learn a truth, you're responsible. You're not ignorant anymore. Then you must accept that truth and grow to full maturity of Jesus Christ. That's why there's one inch high all the way up to six foot five. However tall Jesus is, we've got to keep growing. And we never learn it all. We don't want to remain a milk Christian down here who's learned that Jesus is the Savior. We pray through His name and that's all. We never learn anything else. If you're going to grow to maturity, you learn everything in the book. This is Jesus Christ on paper. Now, in conclusion, 1 Peter chapter 4. There is judgment in the world today. It is. And it's frightening to think about it. Because everyone in this room, or anyone that hears this tape, could possibly be under judgment right now. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 17. For the time is come, present perfect tense, that judgment must begin at the house of God. This is people with God's Holy Spirit in their mind are being judged daily. Minute by minute, every thought and intent of our mind. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Brethren, judging others makes us look more righteous and spiritual than them. That's why we do judge others. To make us look better than the other person. It is a sign of carnality. And Jesus says through the apostle Peter that judgment is now on the house of God. So we must get rid of our self-righteousness and develop the righteousness of God. The concluding scripture, 1 Corinthians 11. I think it's only appropriate since we talked about the Corinthian church. They were the ones that was recorded as being a carnal church. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31 and 32. How do you solve the dilemma of polarizing around men? Therefore, you don't hear what other ministers say and grow spiritually from them as well as the favorite one that you have. Or how do we get rid of judging other people? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If we'll do it ourselves, root out the evil, the sin, the wrong concepts out of our own mind, then Jesus Christ will not have to allow you to be tested and tried until you do purge out that wrong concept. Verse 32. But when we are judged, notice what happens. God says when we, New Testament Christians, are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. He's going to judge us, look down and say, hey, there's old Dave down there. He's still judging other people. I'm going to chasten him. So I go through a trial until I learn and I'm chastened. Because every son that God loves, he chastens. And if you are never chastened, you better find out if you're on God's side. Because if He loves you, you're going to have problems. Because you're not perfect, I'm not perfect. He's going to bring perfect sons and daughters into the kingdom. So my final comment is, if you and I will judge ourselves, we will not have to be judged of God. 
Just like Jesus said after some of the messages to the seven churches, he said, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's listen. 